Liverpool, 1961. So a gay Jew walks into a bar. Now I know that probably sounds like the setup to a truly tasteless joke, and that's probably how it felt, too, to Brian Samuel Epstein. He was 26 years old, and Liverpool was a dangerous place. If you were gay, you were thrown in jail. If you were Jewish, you faced daily taunts from pervasive anti-Semitism. And the bar? It was a, a basement club where teenagers were dressed in drainpipe jeans and dirty leather jackets gathered to see a rock band play, and Brian didn't even like rock music. To make matters worse, he was wearing his favorite outfit, an elegant pinstripe suit. To say that Brian Epstein was a fish out of water would be putting it kindly. Yet what seems like the setup to a truly tasteless joke was the beginning of a revolution. Because that night, Brian Epstein saw the Beatles. And they were nothing special. <laughs> they spent most of their set smoking, drinking, and goofing around with the audience, who loved them, but that's because they were friends and classmates. The band were the most nondescript, unprofessional group of losers that Brian Epstein had ever seen. To make matters worse, they had exhausted whatever little opportunities Liverpool had to offer an up-and-coming rock band. They had even been over to Hamburg and done a stint over there and were kicked out of the country, returned back to Liverpool, basically having hit a ceiling, and it was a low one. But when they decided to grace the audience with a couple of songs and show a little professionalism, Brian was enchanted. He saw in the group's songs a message of love, hope, and possibility. And he walked out of the Cavern Club that night thinking, I'm just the guy to help them share this message with the world. I can package, present, market, and sell them in a way that the entire world will stand up and notice. He dreamed big dreams. He said, the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis. They're going to elevate pop music into an art form. People laughed at him as though it was the punchline to that truly tasteless joke. But three years later, the joke would be on everybody else because Brian realized those most impossible dreams in spectacular fashion, and the world got the Beatles. 53 years later, and thousands of miles from Liverpool, I'm standing before you. I'm a third-generation hardcore Beatles fan. I'm also happily the producer of a number of Broadway shows, from A Raisin in the Sun to Green Day's American Idiot. My shows have won 25 Tony Awards, over 44 Tony nominations. I'm also the author of a number one New York Times best-selling graphic novel, which is a fancy word for comic book, called The Fifth Beatle, based on the life of Brian Epstein. Uh, it's for sale in the auditorium, and you'll see some pictures of it uh, as I speak. And it's also being adapted into a major motion picture for which I'm writing the screenplay. Finally, I'm the co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Musicians on Call that brings music to the bedsides of patients and has been supported by artists as varied as Bruce Springsteen to Britney Spears. I'm very proud of what I've accomplished. I love working in the arts and entertainment, and I can tell you that I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> However, none of that was supposed to happen. I was supposed to work in my family business and sell food products or financial securities. And if I wasn't going to do that, I was expected to be a professional, an attorney, an accountant, a doctor, or an engineer. That's what young people of Indian origin are steered towards doing. We're not supposed to write comic books and produce musicals. That's crazy talk. But Brian Epstein showed me that that's not crazy talk. Brian Epstein's example showed me that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that impossible dream. When I found myself unable to find a living, breathing mentor, I found the story of Brian Epstein. And Brian Epstein became what I call my historical mentor. Brian died in 1967 before I was born, so I never had a chance to meet him but I've studied his life meticulously, and I've learned from his story what to do and occasionally what not to do. And it wasn't easy researching Brian's life. For me, to quote a Beatles lyric, it was a long and winding road. It started off in 1991 when I found myself a student at the Wharton School of Business, and I learned the importance of the case study. So I thought I should study the life of the guy who handled the business of the Beatles. But I had already read all the respected Beatles books, and there's very little information in there about Brian Epstein. At the time, there's also no Wikipedia, there's no YouTube, there's no Google. So I resorted to the most cutting-edge piece of technology that I could get my hands on. It was a device about this big. It was called the phone book. And I looked up the names and numbers of those people who knew Brian Epstein and lived in my nearby area. People like Sid Bernstein, who was the legendary concert promoter that brought the Beatles to the United States. Nat Weiss, 
who was the Beatles' U.S. attorney and became Brian's best friend and closest confidant. And I cold called these people. I said, I'm a young person looking for inspiration, and I want to learn more about Brian Epstein. I was so excited that I forgot to be intimidated, and not one of these people turned me down. And the stories that I learned from those folks over the years were astounding. I'm going to share one of them with you this morning. December 25th, 1963, America. No one has heard of the Beatles. A month and a half later, February 9th, 1964, 73 million Americans tune in to see the Beatles play on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now, how did that happen? It happened because Brian Epstein realized that the hot Christmas present in 1963 was the, the transistor radio. It's a tiny device, not much bigger than an iPhone. And the youth loved it because it was the first time they could take their music with them. No longer did you have to listen to music at home, sitting in front of a large piece of furniture with your parents and your kid brother. You could take your music outside and listen with your friends. This marked a sea change in the consumption of music amongst youth. Brian also foresaw the coming importance of the renegade DJs that were talking to the youth on those transistor radios, people like New York City's Murray the K. And so he endeared the Beatles to these DJs to the extent that he even leaked the band's flight information on the condition that those DJs tell their listeners to please go out to JFK and see the band when they get here. And most importantly, to pass it on, spread the word, tell your friends, bring your friends. It was the 1964 equivalent of tweeting it. And it worked. Then Brian Epstein did a truly disruptive thing he decided to hold the press conference for the band at the airport. Press conferences are held at convention centers and hotel rooms and publicist's office, not at the airport. But by bringing out the fans who cared and the older folks in the media who were skeptical, Brian turned what should have been a simple arrival into a frenzied event. Zero to 73 million people in one and a half months. Incredibly inspiring stuff. But interestingly enough, the stories that inspire me the most about Brian Epstein aren't stories about the Beatles or about the business. They're stories about his personal life, his human struggles. And they're the stories that were the hardest for me to find out, because it took years before Brian Epstein's closest friends and family felt comfortable enough with me to tell me some of these stories. You see, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like to be a gay Jew in the 1960s. I'd mentioned that being, that being gay was a felony, well, it was so hardcore that two men holding hands walking down the street could have been thrown in jail. Brian Epstein's doctors, who were the best in the world, were prescribing medication to him to cure him of his homosexuality, pills that would eventually contribute to his death at the young age of 32 from an accidental overdose of prescription pills. And being Jewish, the anti-Semitism was like a way of life. And Jews didn't work in the music industry. The music industry in the United Kingdom was run by folks like Sir Lou Grade and Sir Joseph Lockwood. It wasn't run by young people with last names like Epstein. So you've got in Brian Epstein a 26-year-old gay Jew running around a dirty old port town in the north of England saying, I found a rock and roll band who are going to elevate pop music into an art form. For me, emotionally speaking, that didn't seem so distant from the 26-year-old scrawny Indian weirdo that I was running around New York City's Lower East Side saying, I'm going to write comic books, and I'm going to take a punk rock album and put it on a Broadway stage. Brian Epstein's story filled me with hope and possibility, much in the same way that I suspect the Beatles filled him that night in 1961. It's why I think he deserves the title, The Fifth Beatle, and why, for me, he'll always be The Fifth Beatle. Because every time I have a new dream, and every time someone tells me that's crazy, every time someone says that can't be done or you can't do that, every time I'm scared to death of the next step in my career, I just close my eyes and I think of that gay Jew who walked into a bar. And I smile, knowing the joke's not on me, it's on the disbelievers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.